Head külalised, mul on hea meel tervitada teid tagasi siin meie innovatsiooniseminaril. Loodetavasti oli lõunapaus teile kosutav ning olgem head, ärge unustage võtka väikest majuspala laua keskelt. Sokolaad hoiab aju heas töövormis. Tuletan veel kord meelde, et teil on võimalik järgnevatele esinejatele samuti esitada küsimusi. Saate sinne tekstsõnumina telefoninumbrile 53-811-999. Need küsimused, millele me täna vastata ei jõua, kuna meie aeg siiski on piiratud, saavad vastatud ABB veebilehel abb.ee kaltkriibs 20. Tehnika ajakirja Popular Mechanics 1909. aasta oktoobrinumbri silmus artikkel, kus seisis kirjas. Tulevikus saab New Yorkis tegutse värimees suhelda Londonis asuva kontori või muu paigaga ilma traadita. Tulevikus saab iga üks sõnumeid saata ja vastu võtta oma isikliku kaasas kantava kõneaparaadi abil. See tuleviku instrument mahub pihku ning seda saab kasutada nii maal kui ka merel suheldes tuhandete kilometri kaugusel olevate inimestega. Samuti ei ole see aparat väga kallis. Kõlab tuttavalt. Selle artikli autor on geniaalne füüsik Nikola Tesla. Tema poolt avastatud on pöörd magnetväli, kõrgsagedusõik kõrgepinged rahva, esimene kõrgsagedusgeneraator ja raadiojaam. Muide, 1891. aastal, patenteeris Tesla seadme, mida tuntakse Tesla trafo nime all ja mille idee oli muuta elektrienergia ülekanne juhtmevabaks. Mul on nüüd au paluda lavale ABB jõuelektroonika valdkonna teadus ja arendustegevuse programmijuht Veli Matti Leppelen, kelle ettekande teema on ABB Power Lab. Please, Mr. Leppelen. Good afternoon. It was nice loan spouse. How, how, how you say? Thank you. I introduce myself a little bit first. I, I, I was born in Helsinki in 1960. My father was working for the company named Strömberg. I started to do some mowing the lawn and that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah it is my, maybe my fault. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Then when I was 19 or 18 years old, uh, went to the company and for some reason I'm still with that company. And now I understand 20 years I, ABB in Estonia. I remember when ABB started the activities in Estonia, I was uh, at that time working, working in, in, in the USA on, on low voltage drives, frequency converter kind of thing. And I thought that, okay, what happens, what happens? But the world has changed. So congratulations for the ABB company. And I, I also uh, would like to welcome all of the external, let's say, students, our customers, for this presentation. And I, I try not to be too dull here. This is an innovation day, you say. And I, I, of course, what is an innovation? Uh, we had visitors from Texas Instruments visiting in Deadville. Now I'm located in, in, in Switzerland. A couple of weeks ago, the Texas Instruments people were there, and, and one of the guys, he, he, he defined the innovation in, in a nice way. He said that in a large company, you have a lot of money. You put that money into something, and maybe then you get an invention. And if you are lucky, this inno invention somehow transforms into an innovation, and then you get the money back. I think, I think that, that, that is something that, uh, that I, at least I like it. it is, it's, it's a simple thing, but that, this is what, what, what innovation is all about. And of course, any company like ABB, myself, I say, that I'm, I'm innovative, I'm innovative, I'm innovative. But what it actually exactly is from 
day to day you work, you do, you... Maybe after years you see that it was an innovation. And I think one of the innovations that ABB has is to come to Estonia 20 years ago. Okay, maybe you have seen this already. But I want to introduce myself a little bit deeper in order to explain why I am talking about those things that I talk about, because I cannot talk about all, all of the... Do I have it? Maybe the other one is. No laser. Okay, ABB has these divisions. And I'm coming from the, let's say, power part of ABB. We also, after, after me, Thomas is talking more about the automation, but even, I guess, you are also talking about power and muscles and robots. But, uh, but uh, basically, my main contacts are in the discrete automation and motion part of ABB. So if I'm talking about something, I will be talking about power electronics, maybe something about motors. If you have questions related to power electronics, drives, power semiconductors, motors, machines, etc., feel free to ask any question at any time, even if I do not have a, you know, billion slides here to, to, to show. But I'm, 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 I'm eager and ready to discuss as, as much as I can. We saw the five divisions of ABB. Each division, of course, has its own management. Each division has their own technology manager, who is the key guy to, to, to discuss within this business. And then in the divisions, they have several business units with R&D managers, etc., etc. On the left here, on a little bit lighter, lighter blue, blue color, we have global lab power and global lab automation. That is the corporate research. Within corporate research, we are something like 600 people, and 10 times more we have in the business units for, for R&D and technology development. The corporate research is divided roughly to two parts, power labs and automation labs. And both labs, as of today, they have five different programs. Here on this slide, we only have, you know, one program, but actually we have five. The automation programs are on the left. The more, more power programs are shown on the right. Then we have local centers in different countries. We have seven centers. We have in Switzerland, in Detville, where, where I work and live. We have in Westeros and partly in Oslo in Scandinavia. I would say about half, more than half of our research is either in Switzerland in Westeros, but then we also have in Ladenburg, Krakow. I, yesterday I came from Krakow. We have operation in Raleigh and, and, and then in, in, in Far East. This is a debt will based slide, you see that Detville has activities in these different programs. If I had a slide for my program, because I'm, I'm in charge of this one-tenth of this activity, power electronics, I have activities in Detville, Westeros, Krakow, and in, in, the, in the USA. You have a chance to see these slides and study them may, maybe later on, so I do not read it out. I will, I will just jump to the next one, uh, which is now I'm going into, into my program activities. This program is, in, in that sense, it is quite somehow, we might say it is vertically integrated or it is functionally integrated in, in some kind of either value chain or, or in the chain of employing the electrical en energy. And, and here I, I might, let, let's start from the bottom. 
we have motors. Motors takes uh, all of us. We know that a lot of the ele electrical energy depends on the study. You, you might say it is 40 percent, 50 percent, or 60 percent out of all of the electrical energy is somehow consumed in motor drive speed, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, or trap traction, or marine, or industrial processes. But the motors, they, they, the energy is delivered through the motors, okay, more and more, but still, out, out of this whole bulk of energy, actually very, very small fraction goes through some power electronic converter. What I have there on, on, in, in the middle, we, we could say what I'm calling hardware integration. We have the boxes with the, with the semiconductors, etc. Quite a small portion goes through those. And then even within this area, we have all kinds of different uh, topologies. One might say that the technology is mature. And we have professors who, who teach, and a lot, lot of textbooks say that this is the topology, this is how it works. But still, there is a lot of, lot of new things that we are uh, thinking about, just how to connect the power semiconductors in order to be able to build a, build a drive, in order to be able to be, be it a motor drive or, or a generator drive. OK, that is uh, the sort of the theoretical point, point of that thing, the topology, it is very nice to, to, to have Fourier transforms and calculate spectra, etc. And uh, this is how it works. I am so lucky in my present position that also the power semiconductors. ABB is not the world's largest semiconductor company, but ABB is quite strong in high voltage, high power semiconductors, especially for our own high voltage DC applications, our own traction applications, and also for some of our competitor traction applications. But here today, the situation is such that, that ABB, we are, we are a major player above, I would say, two, kilo, two kilovolt power devices. But uh, we are developing and thinking about the power devices on silicon. We are, of course, we are thinking about silicon carbide. We are thinking about gallium nitride. We are scouting, we are, we are looking. And that is, that is part of my work and job to, to, to uh, try to provide answers. Our scientists, some, some group of people are quite active in thinking that what if, let's say, white band gap materials, if, what, what comes after? silicon, when is the time and technology and the world ready for, for different base material and different kind of components. And if that happens, then, then also the packaging of the semiconductors with higher frequencies we have, we have higher temperatures and, and so on and so on. So, so we face a lot of challenges just to put the semiconductor device into, into some package. And then these topologies might change. Because if you go to higher frequencies, you can at least imagine that something changes. People are talking about, and I am talking about, that, OK, the passive, the filter component, some inductors, they shrink in size because you, you are higher in frequency. And that, in principle, is there. But could, could, you, could you imagine different topology altogether? I'm trying to think about those. My, my colleagues are trying to think about those. And there are all kinds of proposals. Some are good, some are bad. And actually, we do not know. But that, that is what makes the life interesting. While I have been talking, maybe you have been able to read what I have there. I'm, I'm not going to read it out loud. Some examples where we are working, we are thinking about trench IGBT for higher voltages. We are thinking about have this low temperature bonding to get rid of the solder layer in, in the module, use some silver sintering to get more reliable packages, etc. The topology, five-level converter, it is ACS2000. Some of you may, might, not, might know that converter even better than I do. Cortex, 
is something that I like a lot. It is a brand name, sort of, that we have been developing in corporate research, should I say, during the past five years, and we are still developing it. It is a two-phase cooling system where you basically have some liquid, hopefully not too bad for the environment, that you can then boil at, say, let, let's say, 80 degrees centigrade. You boil it at the surface of a hot component. The, the vapor goes up there and condenses some, somewhere in the condenser and, and then, th then falls down. It is a generic te technology that we have been now sort of piloting in transformers, in motors, even in switchgear, in, in, in drives, be it traction or solar converter. And I think, I think that during the next two or three years, we will introduce even, even more of that. And, and, and personally, I like that a lot. Then in the motor area, maybe this is not so big news, to you, but uh, you mentioned Nikola Tesla. He, he, he invented the induction machine, and he explained how it works. But if I understand how he explained it, he was wrong. But still it works, and that, that, and that, and that, that, that is enough. Induction machine is a very nice machine, simple, robust. It has losses. It doesn't work unless you have currents in the rotor, and, and it is, in a way it is lossy. Then, permanent magnet, synchronous machines, very, very great idea. ABB, for example, we went into windmill and, and we have the Azipod with permanent magnets. Good, but just as of today, there is this political thing that the Chinese, they are restricting the rare earth material. And so, so the price of the permanent magnet per kilogram has increased by a factor of what is it now? Five to ten. And, and it makes it a little bit tricky. So now recently, my colleague Thomas comes from Westeros, he's talking soon after me. We developed what we call a cool motor. It is on the left, here we see the induction machine. Here we have a, a different type of motor with no rotor currents. It is a synchronous reluctance machine, low loss, very old concept, but very difficult to optimize. And, uh, and uh, we have been able to introduce it, but still I think it is only the first step, what we are, what, what we are taking there. Uh, mainly, I, as I see, one of the sort of problems is that we need the frequency converter there and it is quite expensive so you save on the motor but but you have to have the drive so we are working this is this is the over, overall and now I, I think I should speed up otherwise uh, someone will kick me out before before I'm uh, <laughs> I'm finishing some advertising here you see that my program goes 56 percent of my budget today goes for the converter area and then roughly equally to, to the semiconductors and machines. This is where we are. This slide actually is, I borrowed it from, from basically from our power systems colleagues, but if you, if you think about a modern, modern society, we are talking about DC, transmission already, HVDC, for example, between uh, Sweden and Finland, between Estonia and Finland, we have these high voltage DC transmission lines. How many thousand kilometers line is being built up in, in China? We're trying to go up to, up to one gigawatt. That is about the power of a typical, typical nuclear power station to have one gigawatt of electrical power transmitted along one line. That kind of thing. People are talking a lot about car charging, electrical ve vehicle charging. Now I learned earlier this year, and you probably know that the Estonian government, I think, has been, in my mind, quite, quite, quite innovative and far-reaching. They have decided to develop or pr provide infrastructure for 
fast car charging for electrical vehicles all around the country here. And luckily, ABB has been chosen to, to, to provide these uh, this, um, charging stations, which are basically, it is just AC to DC and then DC to, to DC to the battery battery charging stations, and, and, and th that technology has been partly developed in my program also, so, so I'm, uh, I'm glad to see that maybe this money to the inventions leads to innovations and, and eventually is in use. Photovoltaics we are talking a lot. And then lighting we are talking about going maybe, here, here we see residential lighting, but the LED lights, I don't know what kind of lights we have here. They are maybe LEDs, maybe halogen or what. But LED lighting is something that is penetrating, of course, into the buildings a lot. Those lights do not need 50 hertz AC. AC. They, are, they are operated on, 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 on DC. So we are also thinking that could it be that instead of having this ordinary, we have 240 volts AC distribution as, as infra almost all around Europe and in the US they have their own voltages and frequencies. There is a technology push to, to transform the world into, into more DC, DC based. We have our computers, they are based on, they need DC, etc., etc. Even in the machines, my favorite thing is that let's forget about the three-phase 50 hertz machine. Let's think about an electromagnetic machine that is run by the most optimum number of phases or frequencies or DCs or whatever. So, so there is a lot, lot, lot of things that, the, that are sort of uh, uh, in discussions. And, and uh, the world is changing, maybe it is changing slowly, but still it is changing towards this direction. Some highlights what we, we have been doing in, in this program. I already mentioned what we call the cool motor. I mentioned this two-phase cooling kind of thing, what we are doing. I'm sorry. Uh, what we are talking about, especially in the US, they are talking quite a bit in the academia for sort of power electronic transformers. Take, uh, imagine a, a line frequency 50 hertz transformer or, or in, in traction we have in Sweden at least. In Germany, Switzerland, we have this 16.7 uh, 16, 16 hertz single phase frequency and the, and the locomotives, they, if they have the transformer in there, due to the single phase operation, due to the, to the low frequency, the transformer tends to be quite large. And in a locomotive, you do not have too much space. So one idea would be to shrink the transformer without changing anything else. And that is what the conventional solution, actually. And this means that the efficiency of the transformer is very low because you have to make it small. The conductors in primary and secondary are relatively thin. It is running red hot, the transformer. The power efficiency is low. OK, now what we have been de developing here is a power electronic based transformer that actually is there is a rectifier stage. I have a slide. Maybe I. I go to that topic later when the slides comes up here. But the, but the point is that this market business case for this technology is based on the footprint. You get a more efficient and, and as of today, a little bit more expensive solution, but a more efficient solution in the same space so that we can take the 16 hertz transformer out and put something else in. On the, on the place of that. A similar possibility is in marine. In marine also, you, the, the space and weight in, in a ship, it, it has some customer value to, 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 to make it lower. So we are thinking this kind of transformer thing and converter thing also for marine. 
this is a very, very sort of academic and, 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 and rough scale, but the power electronics for, for, for the most part it is you get something power, electrical power from the left in, you have some electromagnetic interference problems, you have to filter it, then you have uh, even more filters, then you have this switching stage that people are usually talking quite a bit about, and then out filtering. Now I'm coming maybe back to the theme of, the, of, of DC. We could draw, and we have been drawing this kind of logarithmic, logarithmic scale, where we have the current and, and voltage, and, and then, then these uh, diagonal lines, they are lines for constant power there. And somehow if I think about a small laptop or so, we have DC-DC converters for less than one watt of power. On the other end, we have here this one gigawatt line, we have the HVDC DC, uh, transmission things, and in between we have all kinds of power supplies, and, and these car chargers, and this PETT is, is, is the power electronic transformer, and so on. So how to, if the world is going to DC, what kind of more or less standard building blocks on this map will evolve? And, and uh, maybe mo the majority of the applications are in the low voltage area that is below 1,000 volts. And, uh, and so on. Uh, with my colleagues in, in, in the different center, uh, centers, we, talk, we see that on this, when we discuss, we see that on this map, of course, this is not a complete map, but still on that, this map, there, there are a lot of white spots, a lot of opportunity. And especially if we now combine the silicon carbides and what have you, and, and how the world could, could be, I, th I think that somehow this is the, the future. We are going to, to that area. All right, I'm not going to give a presentation of basic power electronic build, building blocks, but, but uh, what we are doing and thinking, it is these very, very basic, simple things. On, on this level, the, the, the block diagram, it, it is so that almost everyone knows it. But if you go a little bit more into, in, inside the implementation, you see that there are uh, thousands of points where we can improve. This is one step further in, and so on, and so on. I was talking about the transformer in the train, how you get rid of the 16 hertz transformer, get something, something different that we think that, at least in, in many respects, is better. The key to shrinking the magnetic components, maybe I mentioned it also, that, that the prospect of silicon carbide, for example, is that instead of, say, 5 kilohertz switching frequency, you can go to 50 kilohertz switching frequency. If you have gallium nitride, you might go to 1 megahertz switching frequency. And the magnetic circuits, especially in this case, could be smaller. Okay, here now, just a couple of examples. This, this uh, set of data in this graph is a little bit may, may be confusing because on the, on the left side we have sort of low frequency materials plotted where the, where the maximum peak-to-peak -peak flux, flux density variation is, is this 400 millitesla. Tesla again here. And on the right side, at the higher frequencies, it is only 40, 40 millitesla. But now, 20 years ago, when I was designing or trying to design a flyback power supply, I took a ferrite and was reading the Philips data book, and, and 
using it, and maybe it was even, even operational, the power supply. But now if I look at even, even these graphs, I see that it, it does matter what kind of material you are using in order to try to optimize the losses. We, we do not have the cost, of course, here. Some, some materials are cheap, some are more expensive. But it really does matter what kind of uh, uh, loss density you get in these operation points. And, and moreover, I was a little bit astonished, and maybe I should not confess it here, but I was astonished that the average, or even almost the, the, the top knowledge that we had in our company, in, in this area was, was almost as limited as, uh, as, as my knowledge. But we are, we are advancing. We are, we are advancing, we are, we are studying a lot. These graphs, they come from the, what the manufacturers say. And that is not true. We, we know that if, if you have in power electronics, the waveform is not pure sinusoidal at, at, at a certain frequency with no DC offset. Well, it's typically we have triangular or whatever square wave, wave shapes. We have DC offsets, etc., etc. The flux path in, in, a, in a, take a transformer, for example. The transformer has some, some kind of shape. The flux density at different corners, it is different. The temperatures are different. The, the overall performance, it, it is... It is a fascinating and, and very, very, very promising field to try to understand that. And we put quite a bit of effort uh, trying, to, trying to learn, study from bottom up, from the physical properties, in order to, to see that, okay, th this is how we should design our components. In a similar manner, this shows some trend. We see the timeline from 1990s to, to some near future and maybe even further future. This is uh, our, our own ABB, ABB semiconductor status. How the, how the, the, most, the most dominant parameter for lo power losses in a semiconductor is the, is the on-state voltage drop that, that it has when it is carrying its, its nominal current, and that is this VCE sat on the vertical axis. And then, depending on the, on the voltage capability of the device, the higher the voltage, the thicker you, you must have the wafer, and, 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 and the higher the losses in principle. But here we have plotted this silicon limit, so to speak. It is, it is, we are talking about IGBT here, actually. But, uh, but the silicon limit, it, it's almost a diet. And if we are using silicon, we cannot basically, in a bipolar device, uh, as, as the uh, IGBT insulated gate bipolar transistor is, you cannot go below this limit. That is what I have been told, and that is what I also think is, is the truth. And now the question is, of course, if we go to silicon carbide, gallium nitride, what kind of points on this, uh, on this map we, uh, will we be able to, uh, able to reach? One very interesting thing is, talking about the silicon carbide, is that silicon has also another limit. And it's basically it is 1,000, no, no, no 10,000 volts, 10 kilovolt blocking capability for a silicon device is about the maximum. Uh, above that, you can make it, but it, it, it will tend to be very lossy. And, and one of the biggest promises for the silicon carbide, what ABB was, by the time, by the time Estonia was celebrating your 10-year thing, ABB was putting a lot of, lot of money into silicon carbide activities, found a lot of problems, made a lot of inventions, IP, patents, and then ABB ran out of money. The patents were sold to a company named Cree, and, and now Cree is, uh, Cree is advancing the silicon carbide. So let's see how we go. I think I, I will have to speed up a little bit. Uh, another thing, as a sort of figure of merit, we had the figure of merit for the power, uh, power losses in, in magnetics, some figure of merit for the on-state 
on state voltage drop for, for, for the semiconductors. But if, if, if I, I'm now thinking about packaging, put the semiconductor device into a package so that it is reliable, etc. have the connectors and so on and so on. And eventually there, there is some power loss in the package. Regardless of how efficient the whole thing is, we can make and we have made some rough estimates and studies on the power loss density in how, how many watts of cubic centimeter of power loss we can see that come out of different kind of packages. And uh, to me, this is quite an interesting map because the, the, the kind of packages what we are using mainly today, they are, they are in this, uh, this, let's say, 10 to 20 watts per cubic centimeter range. But there are some examples. For example, this Delphi, uh, it's a, is, was it now Indiana? Atlanta-based automotive company in the US, they have developed what they call a Viper, a very, very thin, narrow power semiconductor package for the automotive water-cooled uh, applications where they have the power loss density something like 600. And even we managed a few years ago what we call a two cool, two side cool, cooled, cooled package together with the uh, friends in Helsinki for LV drives, we made a prototype where we actually were pretty good. And needless to say, we try to, we try to push ourselves and our, our activities to, to this area. There we have a lot of a lot of challenges, maybe one of the last slides will come back to this packaging thing. All right, I already mentioned this uh, higher frequency for, for the magnetics. And, and now what we see, we see again the, the locomotive there. It is uh, the pilot locomotive is running in, in, in Geneva. The blue thing here, it is our power electronic transformer. And on the very bottom of the blue thing, we actually have the transformer, which is now in this schematic. It is in the, in the middle there, but we also have some stray inductances in, in, in this drawing. The concept is very simple. We have, you can see from the, from the uh, photograph that it is a modular structure. It is actually about one megawatt in power. The input, input voltage to this transformer is uh, 15 kilovolts, 16.7 hertz, single phase. And the output is 1500 volts DC for, for, the, for the, actually it is a DC drive, I think, in, in this locomotive. It is quite, quite old, but it could also be an a, a, a AC drive. So how we do it, we have nine of these modules. Each module is uh, something like 110 10 kilo, kilowatt in, in, in power rating. We connect the inputs. Inputs here in series in order to, to, to take this 15,000 volts uh, AC in. And, and then the rectifier makes the line current more or less sinusoidal. We have, uh, we have the, a low voltage, or low, low, low voltage. Is it now around, around 1,000 volts in, in, the, in the DC link capacitor on the left side? And then we have a resonant, resonant tank. You see the capacitor, etc. A resonant inverter that is running the power through the transformer to the secondary, where we then have rectifier. The inputs are in series, the secondaries are in parallel. Well, our target was to get some 5 kilohertz frequency on this transformer. And, and, and if you see on this graph, we have the red cross at, at 50 hertz. If, if you have a 50 hertz transformer, a typical ABB distribution transformer that we are selling, to our customers has a, a, a sort of 
it's not power density, it is the opposite. How many kilograms per, per uh, kVA it weighs? We, we see it is about two. So one megawatt, it is 2,000 two, kilograms of, of a transformer. And now if you use the same core material, like, take, take for example this silicon steel, this green curve. If you go from 50 hertz to is it now 700, 600, 700 hertz on this graph, you see that from, from uh, two, uh, two kilograms you go down to about maybe one. But then if you take, take ferrite and just keep on going to, in this graph, this is a little bit optimistic maybe, and I'm sure it is, but if you go to 100 kilohertz or so, you see that, that the material that we need for this transformer core would go down to something maybe 20 or 30 grams per kVA. And this is now the game that we are trying to play. We were planning to have this particular transformer to run at about 5 kilohertz, but then due to whatever technical problems, it is now running only at, at, at about 2, kilo, 2 kilohertz. We have prototypes in Deadville for the next generation that are running at 10 kilohertz. And maybe in future we are, we are really in, 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 in the area between 10 and 100, 100 kilohertz. So we are working there. And at the same time, even this transformer and the, the good old transformer, what we had, they are oil insulated, oil cooled. And oil is not very nice a thing to have, it might, for example, explode. And it might leak and create environmental problems. Our target, what we are really now doing and trying to do, is that, we, uh, that our transformer, as we get it small enough, etc., it, it will be air-cooled, air-insulated. And I, I, I think that, that really has, has some value, but it is easier to say everyone can understand the principle, but to implement it, it, it takes quite some effort. Well, here we see what I actually already told you. In, in principle, you have the nine levels in series on the, on the input side, and, and then the, the, the outputs are, are in parallel. And also on this, uh, this drawing, we see that one, one of the nice things about this modularity is that if, if one of these levels fails, for whatever reason it fails, we have some redundancy in the, in the dimensioning that instead of nine, you can still run it with eight, so that the train doesn't stop. And, and the failed one, what we, he what we maybe we see here, this bypass switch, if, if, if this fails, these switches are, are co connected so that it is bypassed, bypassed from, from, from the circuit. And this kind of topology, now this example is this locomotive, but the very, very same principle goes to marine. It could go to, if we scale it down in, in power, it could, could go to, to a lot of applications. And as I mentioned, the core, even though this is AC in, DC out, but as I like to talk about DC-DC converters, the core, core of this whole thing is from this DC to this DC using higher frequency here. Another example, this comes from the solar applications. We try to get it better in, in, in power density and also, also better in, in efficiency or power loss. And if we take just what we have, this, what we say, a two-level IGPT inverter and silicon diode, our 6.5 kilo, kilowatt inverter design was roughly, roughly the, the, the blue dot on the, on the top right there. Then we just say that, OK, from this two-level topology, we go to a little bit more complicated, where, where we have di three different levels in the in the DC link voltage, that alone, and maybe we increased the switching frequency a little bit, got a reduction in the losses and in the volume. Then we see that, okay, this uh, silicon diode is a little bit lossy. We take silicon carbide diode. 
did not change the switching frequency. We got to the, to the purple curve there. Then we thought, and, and even, even prototyped that, OK, let's increase the switching frequency a little bit now, because we have the silicon carbide diode. OK, we got the whole thing yet smaller because of the shrinking magnetics. But of course, then, then the switching losses came a little bit up. Then there, on the market, we do have this silicon carbide MOSFET switches, so that we, we through the IGPT output, put a MOSFET in and come back to the 16 kilohertz, got even lower, et cetera, et cetera. So, so th th this is the kind of thinking that is uh, taking, taking place and, and development. All would be very nice, but if I had the price tag here, for the silicon carbide, it would not make sense. But maybe after two or three or four or five years, it makes a lot of sense. And that is why we are now, now playing around with these things and, and prototyping and learning to understand, to have the base technologies somehow at hand that when the time is right, we, are, we don't have to start from you know, ha half naked, not, not knowing what to do. Switching frequency I mentioned. Here we see some rough time scale. It is going up in small power supplies. Now I'm thinking about maybe 100 watt power supplies or even less what you have for, for, for your laptop computers. This is the trend. The MOSFET technology has been IR has been a pioneer in the, in, in the MOSFET, MOSFET devices. That's why we have IR examples here. But during, during, let's say, 20 years ago, we had some 400 million MOSFETs. Now the similar MOSFET is 45 million. So a lot, lot less losses. This figure of merit is maybe the inverse of, of, the, of, the, of the millions. Please don't pay, pay too much attention to that. Then the size. I, I mentioned that higher, higher frequencies, you get smaller size. There is some rough ballpark figure. We, we had a five liter unit for one kilowatt of power. Today it is maybe around here. At least for small ABB AC drives also, we have, quite easily we get one, one kilowatt power transfer through a one liter, one, one liter box. Actually, no problem and so on. Did we still have some more data here? Cost. If it was something like half a dollar per watt, now we are to one-tenth. And I must confess it is for the power semiconductor only. The, the, this figure, the, the, the cooling and mechanics and, and, and the other, other parts what we have, the, the, the cost development has not been that, that much. But here we see the trends. The cool motor I already mentioned, and maybe I can confess here that we had some problems. It was designed, this is the rotor plate. This design, how it evolved from, from 2007, 8, and, and then the final version here. Uh, uh, it was optimized after optimized after optimized for maximum torque per ampere of the machine, etc. And finally, it was so good in that sense that uh, some of these bridges of steel here, they were so thin that in the real operation when it was rotating at 6,000 RPM, this uh, forces there, temperature variation, fatigue, etc. So it did, it, the rotor did not, it, it was not mechanically strong enough. So we had to take one step back to make it not totally optimum from the electromagnetic point of view, but to make it uh, robust. So that was some, some learning on, on one of my first slides. I had this multi-physics approach. And that is what I would like to maybe mention here. 
Even things that look so simple, if you, if you really start to think it is not only Maxwell's equations, it is also some other equations that you have to take into, in, 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 after all, you have to take into account in, in, in the physical world before you get a, even a simple thing robust enough. And that's why I really wonder how the camera companies can make cameras, for example. How many different technologies they are using. I, I, I really admire them. Uh, this used to be some uh, converter, but something went wrong. And uh, usually, when something goes wrong, you first hear a sound and then you see some smoke, and hopefully, everyone is uh, alive after that. So, so uh, it's, it's nice to talk about these big things, but, but we must take it very, very, very seriously that, that our designs are safe. Not only the hardware, but software, etc. So we are also putting quite a bit of effort in trying to make redundancy analysis, reliability predictions. We use the different standards and try to calculate on, on paper how, how it should be. And then we also do a lot of testing, testing, testing. Because w whenever you test, you assume that, OK, now I prove that my design is safe. And then after two, f two weeks, you see that, OK, something went wrong. It was not so safe. So we make the changes. So this is, th this is a, a branch of power electronics that is gaining in importance at the same pace when we get the power electronics into our electrical vehicles, into our DC distribution, this or that, or, or into, into our solar converters, or, or our, our wherever the power electronics comes. It is not, not only that, yes, it works. It must be safe. It must be reliable enough. Thank you. I do not know, did I exceed my time? Thank you for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, I saw you were sleeping, but of course it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was rather vice versa, very enlightening. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have one question to you from my mm -hmm. own side. Um, at the first, I was mentioning about a little bit Tesla inventions, and one of them was Tesla Transformer. The Tesla Transformer was actually transforming the power in a wireless way. Yeah. When could that be a yeah. possible in a commercial basis? Wireless. Wireless, wireless power, power transmission. Trans radio yeah, but I is mean already a wireless power transmitter. We are, uh, I did not have a special slide here, but if you remember this power electronic transformer for traction, for example. Mm -hmm. Similar concepts we are, we are thinking for going to 20 kilovolt or 50 kilovolt uh, line frequencies for large, large industrial drives. And, uh, and there to have the gate drivers and control circuits for these series connected things. Mm -hmm. uh, one idea is to, is to transmit this auxiliary power, and, and now so something like 100 watts or even less, mm. over a distance of 10 or 20 centimeters so that you have the galvanic isolation in, in a safe manner. We are prototyping that, and mm -hmm. it is quite successful. It is a resonant circuit. So it is not an air cord transformer. It is a res resonant circuit. And, and in academia, a lot, 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 of, lot of work in, in this kind of wireless power transmission. I do have a project just yesterday. I was talking in, in Poland where, where we are, are thinking that just hi hypothetically, for example, if you want to go to subsea, mm -hmm. three kilometers down into the water and, and have some drilling station there, or whatever you are doing there. Uh, you might want to transmit a lot of power mm -hmm. from one box to another box, and there in between you have the walls, of course, and, and maybe just water. So, so that kind of, yeah, we are thinking, and I, okay. I think it is, yeah, really wireless, 
power transmission is something that every motor actually, the power is transmitted through the air gap. Yeah. <laughs> and it is wireless. I, uh, that is a good question. We, we are lo lo looking into it. Yeah. I mean, because the wireless is basically all around more and more on a daily basis. So the yes, question yes, is yes, it is wireless. And, and then also what we are looking is, is of course, this wireless communication. And one quite promising is, is to have free space optical, not radio, oh, well, mm. it's a light wave, but opti op optical transmission. So if, if we are thinking about a optocoupler, mm. you have uh, you have uh, 1500 volt isolation and only 0 0.1 millimeter air gap between the LED and the transistor, but still it is supposed to be safe. But that that is optical communication, basically yeah. there. But the, the optical communication can be. We used to have, you know, the lighthouses, etc. If you go to <laughs> Tallinn and uh, from here to Helsinki, you see the optical the lighthouses. So, okay. wireless power, wireless communication, of course. Okay, but thank you very much. We have a small present also here. Mm, thank you. So, thank you very much. Thank you.